All right, hello and welcome to the Expert Inside Interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you here from a lovely sunny San Diego and just up the road in Marina del Rey is Dr. Greg Stevens. How are you doing, Greg? I'm doing great. How about yourself, John? Excellent, excellent. And he is uh, from the company People Savvy. He's uh, the founder and master coach. And you have over three decades experience coaching emerging and senior executives in the development of wisdom, okay? And you define wisdom as the integration of an individual's head, heart, and hunch. And what we're going to talk about today is transcendent leadership. So this all sounds very grand and exciting, Greg. So can you break down what you mean by, first of all, the, the idea of wisdom being these three parts and what transcendent leadership means? Well, I think, uh, yeah, and I think it's probably good to start with uh, why even have something like this. And uh, the, the critical piece today is organizational vitality. And uh, that's sort of defined as uh, the people in your organization are energetic, have a sense of meaning or purpose in the work they do. Now, let me give you an example from my coaching. Uh, I was working with a company a few years back met the person for the first day, to, and we were walking around the organization, and people looked like their house had just burned down. <laughs> and I, asked, I said, why are people so glum? They said, oh, they just got their performance reviews. And I said, with yeah. what, baseball bat? And uh, he said, no, no, you don't understand, Greg. Uh, we're kind of distant from the corporate headquarters, about 2,000 miles, and, uh, you know, if you're in corporate headquarters, you're a four or five out of a five, and it drops down is the further away you go from the corporation, uh, the headquarters. Right. And so these people are twos and threes. And if you get a three or lower, you're a candidate for replacement. So all these people in this office were candidates for replacement. I can understand why they looked a little gum. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a misery loves company, right? Yeah. So one measure of organizational vitality is employee engagement. And I think everyone's probably familiar with the Gallup polls around employee engagement. And even mm -hmm. today, it's still around 50%. Leadership is a primary driver for employee engagement. And what's often overlooked is employee engagement is a percentage of leaders who are disengaged. Tough to get employees engaged if leaders are not engaged. Which brings us to the topic of how conscious are the leaders. And I, I hear people talk a lot about conscious leadership. Mm -hmm. My question always is, is what aspect of consciousness are we talking about? Because people are multidimensional. They have a physical, imagination, emotional, mental, subconscious, and even unconscious. When we really talk about wisdom and bringing a heart in, we're talking about something that transcends these aspects of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And this implies our essence, or if you're of a spiritual or religious focus, even your soul. Transcendent leadership is a state of being as opposed to a state of doing. Most leadership uh, programs out there talk about what you need to do as a leader. Being a transcendent leader really is about who you are and how you are with others. In this case, being leads doing. Mm -hmm. So the door to wisdom, especially inner wisdom, is unlocked with compassion for self and for others. Now, here's where it gets a little uncomfortable for a lot of business leaders. What opens sure. the door is a thing called unconditional loving. And you try to imagine the word loving with business today, and they don't seem to line up. And yet yeah. leaders, even the, the founder of Whole Foods, uh, talks a lot about loving in his business. And a lot of leaders are doing that today. So let's let's take a look at what I consider the six keys for getting into the state of unconditional loving. Yeah. Uh, first so of, can I just, could, before you get into that, Greg, yeah. can I just uh, um, ask you a couple of questions just based on what, you, what you've talked about so far? So, uh, so number one, I think, I think part of the question is, I'm not sure if anybody or everybody rather asks themselves why they want to be a leader in the first place. I think a lot of people either default into a leadership position or feel that that is kind of society's perception of success, right? If you're in an organization and you move up through the management ranks or, or you start something, you're the head of something. But I don't think a lot of people actually ask themselves why they want to be a leader and what does leadership actually really mean at the end of the day? I of all the uh, leaders I've uh, coached, probably only 10% of them have ever asked that question, so you're spot on. 
Mm -hmm. and, um, most people just get into an organization and continue in the organization. And sometimes they're the survivor who becomes the leader. Right. Sometimes they really want to be the leader because they have some sort of perception, usually around glamour, that what a leader is. And then they become a leader and realize, oh, wait a minute, this is the guy that scrubs the uh, chewing gum off the floor at the end of the day. So, yeah, yeah. So I think that's part. Of, so I think, uh, you know, part of it, as you're saying, you're mentioning about conscious leadership. I mean, there's a lot of I mean, hopefully most of our leaders are conscious, but um, unconscious leaders are don't tend to be very effective. But um, but the point is, as we're saying, is I don't think a lot of people do that uh, level of introspection. So let's go on. You said there were six uh, there were six keys to this. Yeah, the first key is unconditional acceptance. And a lot of people have acceptance and acquiescence lined up together, but they're very different words. Acceptance means you just accept a person for who they are and what they are. Mm -hmm. Still, at the end of the day, you have to make a choice about what values guide your organization. And mm -hmm. does that person who you've just accepted who they are really line up with those values? Right. Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I was working with a uh, company that was doing an organizational transformation and everybody was lining up with a new direction except for the CFO. The challenge was the CFO and the CEO who I was working with were good friends, but the right. CFO was so out of alignment with where they wanted to go that he was actually an impediment to progress. Mm -hmm. So the choice the CEO had to make was, do I let this guy go? And he finally did. Yeah, so I think so. I think that's an important point because when people hear things like you know unconditional love and acceptance and stuff, they think you know you just have to go along with everything. But to your point here is you have to accept the person for who they are. That doesn't mean that that person being who they are is the right fit for your organization. Absolutely, uh, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people who make that decision. Oh, okay, well, I just got to go along with who this is, and maybe they'll change. But the answer is they usually don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the second one sounds kind of religious, but it's not, and it's reverence. Um, and I use the Greek definition of reverence, which is a state of awe for another self. It's kind of like you look at a person and what they can accomplish, and you kind of go, oh, wow. If you use a Judeo-Christian definition, it's a state of fear, and we certainly mm -hmm. don't want to be imposing fear in our organization. Right. Probably too much of that already. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're saying awe is more the the is more what you're looking for, like a sense of awe, wonderment. Is that it? Uh, people can be really fantastic when they have an alignment with a purpose and meaning for being in the organization. They they accomplish miracles. I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen it happen. And then the, then that's when the organization really starts being or having vitality. As so you have a lot mm -hmm. of people doing that, and you wonder. How did that company grow so fast and so successfully? Well, this is part of the reason they do it. The third mm -hmm. thing is presence. And here's where leaders have a really good opportunity because a lot of leaders have so much going on in their heads that when they're talking to their direct reports, they're not present. Yeah. They're somewhere else. And the people sense that and feel that and often feel dishonored because of it. Mm -hmm. And that directly impacts the <laughs> impacts the employee engagement and thus the organization yeah. vitality. And I think, and I think, uh, Greg, that has become more and more of an issue. And it's not just for leaders; it's for everyone in general. But I mean, obviously, it, for leaders, it's it's particularly bad. But that we become the we like to say that we're the busiest we've ever been, but I truly believe we're the most distracted we've ever yeah. been. Uh, and, and if I, and if you were to sit down in front of me and maybe I've scheduled a meeting with you and it's something really important to you, but I see the, out of the corner of my eye, there's something bopping up and down on the screen and from my message app or my phone, there's something on my phone that's, and, and I'm, and I just give in to it and I go, I can't, I have to look at it. And the minute I start to do that, you go, well, I see where I come on the list of priorities. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think you probably are aware of that the uh, current new generations coming into the workforce mm -hmm. seem to be married to their iPhones. Yeah. And I have a friend of mine that was interviewing a young up and coming person and they just started looking at their iPhone in the middle of the interview. At which point he said, well, interview is over. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, so that's it. And, and like I said, it's becoming increasingly difficult for people because we are so distracted. And I think that requires a level of discipline now that probably, um, you know, even a level of discipline that we didn't even need before that we really need to introduce in order to be, because presence is consciousness. I mean, you have to be conscious to be present, right? Present. Yeah. Psychologist Carl Rogers described it as you're listening from a place of unconditional positive regard. Mm -hmm. And it, a critical piece of unconditional loving is very deep listening to the person you're talking with. And it's tough mm -hmm. to do that in today's business environment because there are so many things trying to capture the leader's attention. Absolutely. Fourth, the fourth thing is courage. Uh, and courage is pretty easy. It comes from the French, from the heart. And that's the mm -hmm. part of heart in uh, developing uh, wisdom. Sometimes you got to make decisions that take a lot of courage, even if it's courage for yourself or courage for others within the organization. And you have to stand mm -hmm. up and say, nope, this is what we're going to do. And I may get shot for it, but this is what we're going to do yeah. because it's the right thing to do. So, yeah, yeah. And I think it is. And I think, again, I think that's something that uh, – is becoming increasingly in some ways more difficult because I think people have become very risk averse and, uh, you know, don't want to make a wrong move or stand out or, uh, you know, make the tough decisions, especially when they're hearing all the time about, Oh yeah, don't make tough decisions. Like everybody should be happy and all that tough decisions are so tough decisions and it does take courage. It's like, and, and, and people often look at it. It's like, if, if somebody's not doing well in an organization and you don't address it, right, you are robbing them of the opportunity to either do better or to find somewhere that they fit better. In your, and all you're doing is enabling them to continue to be, to be unhappy and to fail or whatever. So you're not, being, you're not doing them a favor. You're just being kind of cowardly yourself. Yeah. Uh, and going back to the Gallup polls, they uh, actually break out a percentage of people who are uh, – organizationally disengaged. They actually look for opportunities to uh, short circuit the organization. And if you're not making yeah. courageous decisions, you've probably got some of those people working for you. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> the fifth one is gratitude. is operating from a consciousness of service and bringing the wisdom of showing appreciation for all the stakeholders who are involved in your organization. Um, so gratitude is derived from the word grace living in a state of grace or gratitude extends past positive thinking and increases the optimism, compassion, and energy within an organization. And mm -hmm. I think you've probably seen just about every uh, <laughs> magazine, newspaper has had articles about gratitude in the last six months. It's just incredible. The people yeah, really and yeah, and it is, and and there's a and you know, there's a reason why those um, that's happening, and and a lot of it has to do with we we again, it's part of like this pervasive culture that we live in, where we're moving at such a fast pace. We tend to uh, we tend to focus on we tend to notice all the things that aren't working. Uh, we tend to very very rarely notice the things that are working. We tend to be very quick to point out what's when somebody does something wrong or when something's not working we we forget to catch people doing things well uh we forget to to and and we also and because we're always trying to push forward so quickly we forget to be grateful on, of the journey and to be grateful of where we are today and and all those people who've helped us get here you know it's, you said something very important and that is the assumption that people know you're grateful uh, i was working with mm -hmm. one senior executive and uh, he says, oh, my people know that I'm grateful. <laughs> and I said, really? <laughs> I mean, judging on the body language of the people as I walk through your office, I wouldn't say so. <laughs> yeah. And that's why I think it is something that requires a, a, a level of consciousness, a, a level of being conscious about it. And unfortunately, as, we, as I said, is, and again, I think the pervasive culture out there is one of dissatisfaction, right? Of, you know, you always, there's just something else. Things aren't good enough. Things aren't whatever enough. And it's very easy to get caught up in that and real, and instead of realizing around you that there's so many great things happening maybe within your organization or within your life in general that if you took a couple of moments out to give gratitude for, you know, the world would be a better place, right? Yeah, yeah. The last one is probably the toughest, and that's uh, operating it from the point of view of the highest good of all concern. Uh, and if you look in how organizations have formed, uh, it has gone from the founder of the organization to maybe the closest shareholders, to some of the stakeholders, 
employees weren't defined as part of the stakeholder until the 1990s. And mm -hmm. so if you really look at the highest good of all concern, you've got to look at your suppliers and the people who supply them. And that's tough because you're looking at very different cultures often and different practices, organizational practices, business practices. Um, <clears throat> the Romans had a good word for it called sonum bonum, which is a Latin expression meaning the highest good. And though they right. subscribe to it, I think if you do history, We'll probably point out some major failures in that area. <laughs> and yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And certainly we have those similar failures uh, in today's business environment. Yeah, and I think you touched on something there, though, that I think is really incredibly important, and that is the idea of it to all parts of the organization. And organizations are changing dramatically. I mean, one of the things that I've talked with a lot of people about is just the composition of organizations today, the move away from physical locations, you know, to remote working, the gig economy, the, you know, having people, you know, having full-time employees in your organization who are in a building, having full-time employees who are remote, having contractors who do specific work on you, having outsourced companies. So your whole, your organization can become this labyrinth of all these different types of people, both internal, external to the company. Therefore, to do what you just talk, talked about here um, and to make sure all of those are brought together and understand and are, are, you know, are shown gratitude and are brought to the greatest common good, I mean, that, that's quite a challenge. Yeah, the, uh, the heart of our humanity is connection with other people. And as a leader today, you have so many different kinds of people that you need to be connected with. And that means taking the time to stop and listen to what they have to say, and responding to what they say, not reacting. Too many of our leaders still are in reaction mode, and um, mm -hmm. it doesn't do the organization a whole lot of good at this point. So we're in a world of change, and transcendent leadership requires that we have to rise above those changes and really connect with people. Yeah, and I think basically underlying everything you're saying is that is that you you really have to take a little bit of time out, right? You have to take, you have to step back from the noise and you have to look at things you know, in their totality as well as in their individual pieces. Because if you're always in the vortex, you're never going to be able to, you're never going to be able to see all of this. So you have to consciously take time to step back and view things differently. Yeah, you, you said it perfectly. Transcending means rising above that vortex and seeing what's really there. So gaining mm -hmm. some altitude above the day-to-day -day, uh, bumps and grinds that you're faced with as a leader. Yeah, but you. But the point being that you have to consciously make time to do that. It's almost like you got to put it on you. You almost like got to write on your calendar, transcendent time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some companies have actually gone to the point where they are creating meditation rooms and mm -hmm. time, scheduling time with themselves so they can really sit down and go, okay, what's What's really the most important thing? Which the you know, time management people have been talking about for centuries, but yeah. we we need to do it, and we need to do it for our own benefit and for the benefit of the organization. Absolutely. Well, listen, uh, Dr. Greg, this has been fascinating. Before we go, can you tell people a little bit more about yourself and your organization and how they can learn more about you? Well, our our website is peoplesavvy.com. That's two V's in people savvy. And we've been in business for almost 40 years now. Um, we work with uh, large, small, and medium-sized companies globally. Uh, most of my work now today is uh, coaching organizations and coaching uh, higher-level uh, leaders, usually like what you and I are connecting with over Zoom. So uh, that allows me to stay in touch with people I built relationships with 20 years ago that happen to be in Europe, Africa, Australia, South America. So it's it's really wonderful. I don't have to have as many miles on the, as I have. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it's great. I mean, technology is wonderful in the in the yeah. in what it's given us. And now, obviously, with video conferencing, it's allowed us to get that personal connection. And um, yeah, I've I've got uh, I've got relationships with people. Uh, you know, uh, professional relationships that uh, I've never met the people, but I feel like I know them as well as people I've met. Sure. You know, that's yeah. fantastic. It's been great being here with you today and uh, great comments. I really appreciate it.
Yeah, listen, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeline and CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thanks, Greg. Thanks.